back in my day. A sentence said by nursing home season ticket holders, unseasoned reform voters, and those who enjoyed simpler times in the beautiful game. Enough of this nonsense. Because just mention a Jason Roberts, a Hugo Rodallega, a Morton Gamps Pedersen, or a Matty Taylor, because you'll have fans of a certain age saying those very four words. The Barclays era of the Premier League, as it is known, was home to some sensational sides and some sensational players that don't really get the credit they deserve. And when we look back on them, it evokes a sense of nostalgia and the desire for us to hark back to a time where things weren't as analytical, where you had players with more freedom, screamers being scored every week, and Panini sticker albums that give you free bubble gum. I swear, I've not got over the loss of those myself. Whether it be the wide variety of well-known sponsors, a pair of total 90 boots, the badges, or simply the teams like Portsmouth, Wigan, and Bolton back in the day, it has us reminiscing for the better times. Throw in a lacklustre set of Ballon d'Or contenders for 2024, and it has most football fans asking the same question. Was football genuinely better back in my day? I'll be honest, guys. I'm a simple man. I want to see Carlsberg back on a shirt again. I want to see Strongbow. I don't want to see betting companies from Eastern Taiwan on a Wolverhampton Wanderers kit. That's not the MO. And quite frankly, I want to see some better Ballon d'Or nominations. So we'll pause on the Premier League stuff for a hot second. We'll come back to that, trust me, because the montages I've been seeing on Twitter this week with old indie music from 2008 have been some of the best pieces of content I've seen in a while. But another thing that sparked me thinking about this video, and I think a lot of this talking point were the Ballon d'Or nominations released by Le Keep this week and I'm gonna go through some of the names that you see and you can kind of make up your mind yourselves. Jude Bellingham Bears, has had a massive breakthrough season as a Real Madrid player obviously breakthrough in the sense that he's now one of the best players in the world unequivocally that's a <laughs> And to get the thesaurus out for you there, Jude, I'm not going to lie. We all knew about him from even the Birmingham days, Borussia Dortmund. Real Madrid might have to retire his number after the last calendar year, I'm not going to lie. And, you know, big moments like the bicycle kick against Slovakia in the Euros, making it to the final of the competition. The guy's had a sensational year. Fair enough. Hakan Chalunolu. Okay, we've had a, a little bit of a decline now in the quality. To be fair, very important in helping Inter win Serie A. But should he really be the guy that has to be important? It feels like, you know, you compare Serie A at the start of the 2000s and the late 90s, Chalunolu is probably back up like Palmer during that time, I'm not even gonna lie. Danny Carvajal, in fairness, big moments, was class at the Euros, scored in the Champions League final, no problem there in terms of big moments. Ruben Diaz, calm, Artem Dovbik has helped Girona to a crazy finish. Like, when we look at Artem Dovbik's career at the end, he's not gonna be anywhere near a, a Ballon d'Or nomination. He's probably not gonna be someone we look back on and go, yep, yeah, that guy was competing for Ballon d'Ors regularly, but fair enough, he deserves a shout. Phil Foden, Alejandro Andro Grimaldo, Erling Haaland, Matt Hummels. I mean, a, what, 47-year-old Matt Hummels? To be fair, again, important in the Champions League final. There's not much that can be said in terms of, like, these guys have had big moments. Emiliano Martinez always has big moments for Argentina. Adam Olalukman, hat-trick in the Europa League final. These guys deserve to be here in terms of what they've done in the last year. It's more just like, I think that's almost telling of the rest of the quality of the teams they're coming up against in terms of individual players. I'm trying to explain this in a way that makes the most sense, but I think let's, let's take a look at some old Ballon d'Or top 10s, and we'll see if the Ballon d'Or top 10 from this year is going to come anywhere close to that. Because, spoiler, it's going to be between Venetius Jr. and Rodri. And Rodri winning a Ballon d'Or would be deserved for him specifically is an indictment to where the beautiful game is right now. Let's take a look at 1998, for example. We had Zinedine Zidane winning it for Juventus. Now, did he deserve to win it that year? Absolutely. I mean, he absolutely dominated the polls. He won the World Cup. He won France 98. Got 26 goal contributions in 45 games. Won the World Cup. Was in the team of the tournament for the competition, won Serie A as well, and was a Champions League finalist. Fair enough. The rest of that top 10 has Davos Shukarin for Real Madrid, Ronaldo as in R9, Michael Owen, Rivaldo, Gabriel Batistuta, Lilian Turam, Edgar Davids, Dennis Bergkamp, and Marcel Desailly. People like Roberto Carlos, Alessandro Del Piero, Raul and Clarence Seydorf weren't even in the top 10. David Beckham was joint 28th. So that's the, the level of quality all the way through. We'll skip forward to 2000, all right? Turn of the millennium, and we got Louis Luis Figo winning it for Barcelona, okay? When he was taking a break from being assaulted by pig's heads, he was actually doing a very good job for Barcelona. He got himself 14 goals and 16 assists in the 99-2000 season, then 14 goals and a massive 27 assists in the Galacticos Real Madrid team, became the most expensive player in the world and won La Liga both years. In second place, Zinedine Zidane. Third, Andrei Shevchenko. Then it was Thierry Henry, Alessandro Nesta, Rivaldo. There was Gabriel Batistuta, Raul, Paolo Maldini, and David Beckham all in the top 10. There was only no R9 
playing here because he's basically injured for about two years straight. You've got the likes of Totti, Roberto Carlos, Patrick Kluivert, Pavel Nedved, David Trezeguet, Marcel Desailly, Rui Costa, Roy Keane, Juan Sebastian Veron, filling up the top 30. The quality control is going mad. And these are like evenly rated players to an extent as well. All of these had peaks and would have made them the best player in the world for at least a six month period in their career. In 2003, things get absolutely ridiculous. First of all, Thierry Henry absolutely robbed. But Pavel Nedved ends up winning it and in fairness is himself an insane player. But behind him, as I mentioned, Thierry Henry, Paolo Maldini, Shevchenko, the usual candidates. You had Zidane, Ruud van Nistelrooy, Raul, Roberto Carlos, Buffon and David Beckham. Then it was Ronaldo R9, Henrik Larsson, Del Piero, Dida, Nesta, Deco, Totti, Balak, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Inzaghi, Ronaldinho was joint 22nd, bruv. Sol Campbell, Ika Casillas, Samuel Eto, Luis Figo, Oliver Kahn, Patrick Kluivert, Claude Makalele, Michael Owen, Paul Scholes, Lilian Toram, Patrick Vieira didn't get a single vote. Patrick Vieira, bruv. This was the year of the Invincibles. It's fucking ridiculous. The only player not getting a vote on the current Ballon d'Or list right now is Vitinha. And in fairness to Vitinha, he had a great season for PSG. Pretty impressive and a nice surprise because he's probably the type of player that a lot of people thought didn't have that in him. But Vitinha is is not Patrick Vieira, okay? For many reasons, in fairness to him, but definitely in terms of his footballing ability. Now, don't get it twisted. There's players on this list that are going to grow to become sensational, all right? Jude Bellingham is obviously one. William Saliba, Lamine Yamal, Florian Verts, Nico Williams are all going to go on to have amazing careers, and actually, that's probably the best thing we can take from this. Rather than the players that are actually in their prime, the players that are young and below the age of 25 on this list could genuinely go on to be world beaters and have the potential to make it quite an evenly contested Ballon d'Or again. After an era of Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo dominance, maybe that's why it feels like there's been a void left behind. We've had two players dominating things for so long. Now that we're away from that, now that neither of them have been nominated, it feels like there's just nothing left. I mean, at the end of the day, Mo Salah, for fuck's sake, has got to be one of the best players on the planet. He wasn't even nominated at all. The Ballon d'Or's often been quoted as being a bunch of journalists and people voting for their friends. And in fairness, that's what the results sometimes lead to. But for that to be the list of nominations is pretty underwhelming. In fact, you know, as much as I said, there's, there's players here who had big moments like a Danny Carvajal, a Danny Olmo who was sensational at the Euros. I think part of the problem here and the why it doesn't look so exciting is because there's just not as many exciting players anymore. I mean, first of all, you know, in the eras that I was talking about there from 1998 all the way through to 2006, 2007, we're talking about teams running two strikers, right? So you have to have more goal scorers and like exciting forwards that everyone wants to be when they grow up on a Ballon d'Or list because there's just more strikers to hand. Like I mentioned there for 2003, you had Thierry Henry, you had Shevchenko, Ruud van Nistelrooy, R9, Henrik Larsson, Del Piero, like they're all just out and out number nines. I mean, you're scoring more on that list than Kyle Walker walking into a brothel at the end of the day. Compare that really to the list that we've got here and I'm looking at it now. Apart from Ireland, you've got Kane and Dovbik. There's three strikers on that list of nominees. You've got a lot of wingers there as well, but a lot of them again are this type of quite impactful, gonna get you goals, but not totally exciting type of winger, like a Bukayo Saka, for example. Scores great goals and, you know, generally speaking, is a sensational footballer. I love Bukayo Saka. But he's not the type of guy to Elastico pass someone. There's no room for a Zinedine Zidane in the current era or a Deco or a Ronaldinho for that matter. That's not really got the work ethic, but he's going to produce moments of magic. System-wise, everything's a lot more tactical now. You have to be able to run. That's why the number 10 has slowly died a death. Mesut Ozil was one of the last ones that we ever saw. I mean, the guy's become a bodybuilder since, for fuck's sake. He's turned to steroids because he's fallen out of love so drastically with the a beautiful game that he wants you to play. And freedom is a word that I want you to remember, as if you're a Scottish man fighting for independence. It's shy being Scottish! Because that is exactly why I think we look back on the, the mid-2000s, the late 90s with such fondness. As Zinedine Zidane could quite literally do fuck all, all game, in terms of like pressing or defensive work or any sort of work ethic, pick up the ball with a beautiful touch, drift past three players, get an assist, and we'd all remember it till the end of time. Ronaldinho could do next to nothing in terms of helping his teammates, but they could cut in at the Bernabeu, skip past four players, slot it past Ika Casillas, one of the best goalkeepers in the world, and he's got the whole stadium bouncing. But the thing is, we weren't restricted to just that when it comes to really, really top quality Ballon d'Or contenders. We had that in the Premier League too. Look at Portsmouth's team from like the, the mid-2000s. Were they going to win anything major? Probably not, but they had exciting players that scored exciting goals. Matty Taylor would just yam the ball from distances 
as soon as it sat up off a mole hill. Lamar de Luar Luar had a bit of skill, and then when he scored, he did 17 backflips. Jermaine Defoe and Peter Crouch were the ultimate little and large combination. At West Ham, you had Dimitri Payet. At Bolton, you had JJ Okocha. Wigan were sending scouts to Central America and bringing eight guys back from Nicaragua that none of us had ever heard of, and they'd actually end up being pretty decent. Players were able to express themselves, whether it be through skill or whether it just be slapping a goal from distance. And the thing is, the statistics actually back this up. If you compare 2013 all the way through to 2019, the actual average or the amount of shots being tried from distance is going down dramatically. And it's because managers have realized that you're less likely to score from 35 yards out than you are from 10. Back in the 2013-14 season, the number of shots at like being outside of the area or long distance quote was 44%. That had gone down to 38% by 2019. In fact, over the last 10 years, pretty much every metric available will tell you that the distance in terms of shots being taken and goals being scored has shrunk massively in terms of yards away from goal. Stats, analysis, and tactics dictate realistically that a player should be as close to the goal as possible to increase the overall chance of scoring, whereas it was just absolute carnage back in the 90s and the 2000s. There wasn't really that sort of analytical data. There weren't actual jobs available for people to sit down and study the beautiful game. It was just whatever a manager thought, and then there was an element of freedom amongst the players and a little bit of trust in how good they were at certain things. If Steven Gerrard was on the ball from 35 yards out, trust him, because he might bang it top corner. Overall, there's a lot less individualism when it comes to forwards now. You know, you've got systems where you don't even need a striker. I mean, you look at Arsenal, they're playing Kai Havertz up top. Gabriel Jesus is barely a striker, realistically. And those are their attacking options in terms of down the middle. Combine the overusage, maybe, of data and analysis to make things a lot more mathematical, as well as things like shirts just being a lot more dictated in terms of sponsors, playing surfaces being a lot more pristine, games being a lot more tactical and, and chess-like almost at the higher level anyway in comparison to some of the games that were happening in the mid-2000s. And it's easy to come to the conclusion that it's just not the same. It doesn't have that same magic anymore. You even look at FIFA. Like, we were playing FIFA back in the day, right? Some of the cards, some of the players were sensational. The highest rated players for FC25 is kind of depressing, I'm not going to lie. You've got Mbappe at 91, Rodri at 91, and Haaland. The idea of a defensive midfielder being one of the best players in the world on a video game where you go to have fun and enjoy the chaotic side of football. I feel like I'm playing FIFA with a UFO. It's probably not something that's like that nice to look at or like that pleasing. Then you've got Bellingham at 90, Vinny Jr., De Bruyne, Kane, and Odegaard, Donnarumma, and Alisson. I don't know who the fuck Donnarumma's paying at EA Sports, by the way. What the fuck is going on there? It doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing as having Lionel Messi and Rude Van Nistelrooy and a 94-rated Roberto Carlos or something. The fun players, do you know what I'm saying? So yes, the shirts aren't as baggy and don't look as cool. The sponsors aren't as fun or as iconic as they used to be. The boots don't maybe seem as cool. There's too much data and the grass is millimeter perfect. But what that has done without people necessarily realizing is make football so much better. And bear with me, okay? I don't mean as iconic. I don't even necessarily mean as fun. The Invincibles Arsenal team is finishing maybe fourth in the league these days. Look in my eyes. No one wants you here, blood. The actual technical ability of footballers now throughout an entire starting 11 is on a different astral plane to what it was 20 years ago. It is a joke. I watched highlights of a Chelsea the Arsenal game from either 2003-04 or the season after. So it was either the Arsenal Invincible season or the season where Chelsea won the league. Either way, two of the best teams in the entire nation had a 30 second spell where they were just heading the ball and lumping it long back to each other. That is a clip that gets into FTW because it's so bad from like the Ecuadorian second division. And this was happening on the grandest of stages in the Premier League. And some will say that's more pure and it's more fun. I kind of agree to an extent. Extent. There's there's less structure. There's less like chess match stuff going on. It's not as good objectively They're not as good as a footballer as a Kevin De Bruyne now or a Martin Odegaard now in the Prem I saw a compilation on Twitter actually going through all the best moments of the Premier League since the start of the season So just for August there's been some fucking cracking goals and moments generally speaking already Noni Madueke calling Wolverhampton a shithole then dunking a hat-trick on their foreheads is class. No, listen <coughs> I just want to apologize. Cole Palmer also scored a banger in that game. Speaking of Wolves, John Bellegarde scored a screamer against Forrest. Eve Bissouma's goal against Everton, cracking in off the crossbar. Proper Barkley's old school goal. You've got Erling Haaland scoring hat-tricks left, right and centre. You've got Jordan Pickford's mistake against Sung Min Son. Liverpool putting three past Manchester United. The last minute, 99th minute goal from Joao Pedro against United. The controversy of Declan Rice's red card. There's good stuff happening there. There's cool storylines. There's underrated footballers scoring beautiful goals. It's right there on under our noses, it just doesn't have
have that same feel because of the things that we grew up with. Ultimately, as humans, we're always going to look at things through rose tinted glasses, and that's calm. I do miss 2002, where all the kits were baggy and looked so much better than they do now. I do miss Liverpool having Carlsberg on their shirt. I do miss Fernando Torres being in a long sleeve shirt with a hairband and total 90 boots. I do miss the idea of a player not having to contribute that much defensively, but still being a useful asset to the side, like a Zinedine Zidane, a Dimitri Paye, a creator who could just pop in and out of a game and make you fall in love with football. But do you genuinely think there won't be any streets won't forget players out of this current generation? Of course there will. Jean-Philippe Mateta has got that written on his forehead already. The guy's tucking his shirt in like he's R9 off of three months of good football, and he's banging in goals left, right, and center. He is going to be the epitome of that in eight years from now. Brian and Burmo and Johan Wisser combining together. Streets won't forget Premier League shenanigans. Kao Rumitoma did not get a degree in dribbling to get forgotten about by the streets. At the end of the day, we're not going to know how this era is going to be looked back on because we haven't got there to look back on it yet. And it probably won't be as magical. It probably won't be as entertaining to an extent in terms of individual attacking brilliance. But you'll still have absolute screamers to look back on. You'll still have amazing players to look back on. You'll still have underachieving teams where you'd have no idea how they made it to a Champions League final or a top four or to European football. You'll still have teams full of players that you have a little soft spot for. Because no, football probably never will be like it was in 2004 and that is genuinely a shame. But in 10 years, trust me, we will find ways to look back on this era and forget about all the boring things. But I do genuinely want to know what your thoughts are down in the comments section because th this is something that definitely splits opinion to an extent. I think everyone looks back on that era with fondness. I do. As I said, I don't want everyone to think like, nah, that's an overrated era because it's not. I fucking love the late 90s through to the, even the 2012 sort of time is definitely a golden era of football before finance has started to dominate things as well something i didn't talk about too much in this video before data analysis and tactics really started to dominate too it felt like everything was a little bit more free-flowing so what do you guys think what era do you prefer drop it down below if you did enjoy this video though feel free to slap a like on it and of course subscribe if you are new to the channel you can also follow me on social media it is at official fng on twitter and on insta it's been a pleasure ranting at you guys today have a wonderful day enjoy yourselves and goodbye.